Welcome to Conversations for a Preferred Future. I'm Jan Spencer. And the purpose of these conversations is to call attention to people, organizations, and actions coast to coast, taking initiative to point the way towards a preferred future. And this conversation right now is conversation number four with Bob Randall in Houston, Texas. And conversations one, two, and three are on YouTube. You can access those conversations and other useful educational permaculture uh, information by my website, suburbanpermaculture.org, suburbanpermaculture.org. There are several more uh, conversations to come after this one. At the end of our conversation here, I'm going to put the schedule up again so you can see that. So let's meet Bob. I'm going to tell you just a little bit about Bob here before I ask Bob to say anything. But I've actually known Bob. Uh, I knew Bob before I moved to Eugene because I used to live in Houston, and that's where Bob is. And he has been a permaculture mainstay in Houston for decades. Bob has been an urban food systems activist for more than five decades. He was executive director of a very important nonprofit in Houston titled Urban Harvest. He has a strong interest in community gardens, school gardens, farmers markets, adult gardening, food production overall. He literally wrote the book on year-round gardening for Houston, Texas. He wrote a book about gardening in Houston. Bob is currently on the board of the Permaculture Institute of North America. We'll find out a little more about that shortly. Bob is a pioneer of suburban permaculture, starting his subtropical food forest, something around 1979 there in Southeast Houston, Southwest Houston. Bob is also known for his research and document, documentation on climate change and its effects on food production, particularly in Southeast Texas. I thought I was a weather and climate wonk. Um, uh, I pale in comparison to Bob. So, Bob, it's nice to have you here. Hi, Jan. Good very, to be on. Yeah, very good. Okay. Let's just start off <clears throat> with this picture right here. We want to know a little bit about your background, Bob. You had a life before you were into urban agriculture, but uh, I think safe to say your experiences led you to where you are right now. So just tell us a little bit about your background and tell us about this photograph right here. Sure. Um, well, I to, I'm almost 79 years old, so I've had a life uh, like anybody is 79. Um, when I was in school back in the day, I got really interested in chemistry. There was this man named Linus Pauling who um, had discovered pretty much a lot to do with vitamin C. And uh, I went off to college aiming at being a chemist. I did some, um, assisted a professor working on antioxidants, flavonoids, and in summers, I did pesticide research for a company and uh, gradually got sick of that approach, literally sick of it, uh, chemistry. And um, looking around for something else, I also had become an activist. Uh, 1960 was when I went to college and the 60s were full of all sorts of issues. Um, I came in contact with uh, the singer Pete Seeger. He basically said the best thing he'd ever tried doing was helping people. 
And I thought that sounds like a good idea. Um, and um, I also ran into this book by Helen and Scott Nearing called How to Live a Good Life in an, in an Insane World. And uh, that was about their efforts to homestead in Vermont and Maine um, in the 1920s and 30s. And a uh, really amazing book and inspiring people, even when we finally saw them uh, in Berkeley decades later. And um, the, the thing that was interesting was that uh, we also was this war brewing in Southeast Asia. And so I joined the Peace Corps and headed off to West Africa. And that's where this picture was taken. I was the head of a math department at 22 years old in a rural high school. It's not quite true that I'm entirely an urban food person. I'm also a rural, I'm very interested in rural food systems because I think the whole business is connected. But uh, anyway, that's me. I did a lot of stuff. That's my library staff, the school library. And that's what that picture was taken. I was not making enough money to afford film and photographs. So there weren't very many photographs. But this was uh, northern Nigeria on the edge of the Sahara, uh, nine months without a drop of rain and uh, temperatures of 120 uh, for a couple of uh, months in, the, in May or so. And uh, Lots and lots of diseases, lots and lots of problems. The British government had just abandoned Nigeria four years earlier. And uh, the enormous amounts of violence, and I ended up being in a massacre there and basically got back to the United States in 1966, uh, late, and uh, enrolled in a graduate program at uh, SUNY Binghamton where I met Nancy, who uh, we've been uh, domestic partners now for 52 years. And uh, she also an anthropologist and um, interested in many of the same things. So uh, in 68, we, met, we married, moved to Berkeley, and we're there uh, during the late 60s uh, pursuing anthropology. Um, that led me to be interested in food systems in general. And by then I was very interested in ecology, which was relatively new science in those days. And uh, went off to Southeast Asia, a small island between Mindanao and Borneo to look at food production there. And um, with the two of us basically spent uh, 15 months on this island. And um, one of the things that I found out was that you simply can't find any place in the world that was a former colony that hasn't been totally disrupted by colonization. Uh, particularly, uh, they have figured out when they left, the US left in 46 from the Philippines, that they figured this out, that uh, you don't actually have to control the country politically. All you have to do is get them in debt and you've got them. And they are going to export food cheaply and cheap, cheap labor forever. And they're never going to get out of this. And so I realized that there really wasn't a whole lot you can really do about that problem unless they can somehow or other deal with that debt issue. Uh, people there in the island we were on were growing coconut and selling dried coconut for what in 10, 15 years ago was less than one half cent per hour wage. And stuff's being used in people's shampoo. Anything with the word laurel in it probably came from there. And so Americans don't really know uh, North Nigeria, they were selling peanuts that go into feeding Danish hams that go into ham sandwiches in the United States. And so basically, unless we do local food, uh, you can't change what is a really degradation and a really bad situation. 
Um, so that's basically it. I did a dissertation. Uh, we ran into some very interesting people, uh, particularly in Berkeley. There was this couple named the Olkowskis who wrote a book called The Urban People's um, Guide to F Food Growing and had this amazing garden in a very small space, um, cauliflowers on the roof. And um, I never really forget that because I came out of there and Berkeley was supposed to be this amazing place. And instead I came out of there and looked at this and said, boy, this is an urban desert. Nobody is doing anything with the land except for this one place. And they did a whole lot of interesting books. And there was this uh, integral urban house effort that was made with a bunch of people there. And a lot of what permaculture is, which is right there, is um, essentially a lot of that was uh, stuff that people had, were doing with this integral urban house effort. But uh, we moved around. We were in, had a number of different gardens. They each got bigger and bigger. And uh, when I was teaching at Cal Riverside, uh, we had were able to rent on a two-acre orchard and learned a lot about growing fruit trees. And then I got a job in Houston and we moved there. And I taught for seven years in the university and really felt like teaching was great and figuring out what was wrong was great, but what I wanted to do was really fix it. And uh, that required getting involved with nonprofits. So that's, that's it in a kind of really fast summary. Uh, but I became a full-time community organizer starting in 1988 uh, with a community garden program. Uh, yeah, well, uh, we'll get to that in just a second. Yeah. We want to we want to get into some of the activism, but let's first take a look at permaculture here, Bob. This is a uh, a graphic representation of permaculture. Just tell us a little bit briefly about permaculture. How would you describe permaculture? Well, uh, it's always been an interesting question because basically it's a course that's designed in about a hundred hours or stuff but it's a, it, it was started in Tanzania by two uh, people who were interested in ecology and systems efforts and they were they realized I think first that agriculture was uh, not possible in the long run if you did if you depended on fossil fuels to do it and that forests for example were way more productive than than say wheat farms or tomato farms or any of this stuff that way more biomass was produced by forests without people even bothering to do anything and they decided that you could design agriculture in such a way as it would be much more abundant with much less impact on the planet. And they realized there would be an end to fossil fuels, both because of supply and also because of pollution. And so this was in the mid 1970s. Um, I ran into the book in the late 70s, the first book and ran into the people who started it, namely Bill Mollison, in the late 80s and early 90s. And um, when he was in, the, in Texas. And uh, basically, there are four principal ethics in the heart of the whole business. People care, earth care, surplus, fair share, and future care. And the basic idea behind it is that when you make major decisions, they should be for the future, to your grandchildren's grandchildren, everything that is living a hundred years from now, we should be paying attention to when we decide where to invest money in labor, uh, government decisions, all of that should be made thinking in terms of the long run, not the short run. And of course, as this uh, graphic indicates, and as people familiar with permaculture know, it 
is far more than an agricultural system. You could design a bioregional economic system with permacultures fitting in within the boundaries of the natural world and bring out the best in people also. Yeah, that is, I would have, should have gotten to that a little bit is that basically they started out doing agriculture and then realized that you could not have a permanent agriculture if you didn't have a permanent culture and that in order to have that you had permanent nature had to have permanent nature and you had to have permanent communities meaning housing transportation um, commerce schooling uh, and uh, everything else and so they basically said you've got to actually include all these things when you make a big decision and um, there are ways you can design any of this using um, design principles that come out of forestry and the experience of two million years of indigenous wisdom and they explore these are what some of these design principles are all those little bubbles on there um, and they come out of forest ecology and indigenous wisdom. And uh, it's a really masterpiece of concepts. There are other ways of describing it. Um, uh, David uh, Holmgren created this flower that other people have used uh, and the principles are broader, but these are basically what we use when we design. And I wanna say a word or two about what I mean by design. Um, when I make a decision, I could do a snap decision, which is kind of like do it by whim. This sounds like it might work. It's good. Try it. Okay with that. Planning involves figuring out what your goals are, how you're going to get it, who's going to do it, when are they going to do it, in what order, all that stuff. And uh, design is planning based on principles that we know work. So it isn't just planning. I could plan, I always say I could plan to put a bridge across one of these bayous we have in Houston, but I don't know the first thing about bridges and I would almost certainly create a bridge that failed. And a lot of people wouldn't like the bridge either probably because I don't know what I'm doing. But if you had those, you can design things if you have the principles. And these are the principles uh, they said, and permaculturalists have done this all over the world, and they work. If you follow those things, you will have a permanent culture. And, uh, you know, there is no way. So the earth is, is what we have. This is our home, and you can't dump your pollution in, in, in your home. It isn't going to work. Right. So let's move along a little bit because we want to hear uh, some of your activist involvements. And let's take a look. This is Urban Harvest in Houston. Tell us a little bit about Urban Harvest because that takes in a lot of uh, these concepts and ideals for living more planet friendly and people friendly. Tell us a little bit about Urban Harvest. Right, I could. Um... Houston's a fourth biggest city in the United States. And so there's a lot of stuff going on. There are well over a hundred environmental groups and things like that. And in the late eighties, I think the food growing was coming very close to going extinct, at least among gardeners. Uh, like the hooping crane, it almost disappeared. And despite the fact there were people all over the place that knew fruits, knew vegetables, knew organics, knew this and that, but uh, people weren't, didn't know about them. And the hunger crisis of the late 80s started a community gardens program. So the first staff came out of that, although there was a, there's a history of earlier efforts and things of different sorts. But we created a community garden program and worked on a variety of other things in our spare time. 
um, somebody, Jan, knew uh, Jacqueline Batiste, uh, was really heavily involved in that. And um, that didn't work out as well because we weren't able to do what we wanted to do. And But we built up a group of volunteers. And in 1994, we started Urban Harvest. So we went from no desk and no telephone at the Hunger Coalition to $500 in the bank when we started Urban Harvest and about eight people. But um, when I retired in 2008, we were up to uh, an annual budget of about $850,000. And we had about over 20 people on the payroll. And so that, and what we did gradually was start program after program of things that needed doing, which are pretty much the permaculture list of what you should do. So we started the first farmers markets that were really farmers markets. We started a fruit tree sale that has typically raised about a uh, grossed about $150,000 in fruit tree sales in about three hours once a year. Those are some of the volunteers involved in putting the thing together. You can see the plants being put in columns by variety. Uh, we started on a small lot and a few years later, we were already in the parking lot of uh, major uh, football stadiums. And uh, we sell the fruit trees is really popular among people of all sorts. Uh, every ethnicity, every income level, you name it, because we already know they work. We're, we're selling good tasting things that work. And fruits are much less work by and large than vegetables are. Um, that's the farmer's market. Uh, it took 11 years to figure out how to get one of these things started. But once we figured it out, it grew like just crazy, like a weed. Is, is that all citrus? What's on the tables there? That's all persimmons there. Persimmons. I, think. I see. Okay. I think those are all Asian persimmons. Um, most likely that's what they are. They, yeah. I think so too. yeah. Uh, and, you know, and within uh, four years of starting the first basic farmer's market that is actually farmers as opposed to somebody buying stuff and reselling it and claiming to be a farmer's market, that, that um, we had, there were up to 24 farmer's markets in Metro Houston. Once we showed that it worked, all sorts, and the people then got the idea that, hey, there was amazing local produce available. Whereas up until then, a lot of people just thought you couldn't do it. Um, so, uh, and there's a whole set of procedures as to what you have to do to get a farmer's market going. It took us a while to figure out what it was. Uh, mainly, we got a lot of help from the New Orleans one that did. Sure. So there are other programs there at yep. Urban Harvest. Yep. And tell us a little bit about what's going on. Is this part of Urban, urban Harvest or what's the yeah, story? Yeah, that is, that is Urban Harvest for, if you're talking about average homeowners and community gardeners and things like that, uh, we teach a lot of adult classes that people can sign up for. They don't have any prerequisites typically. And I'm teaching a class in citrus. We normally had about 70 kinds of citrus or so on that those tables for people to taste and a lot of citrus will come true from seeds so you could just take some seeds and plant them and seven eight years later you've got citrus but we teach a lot of fruit tree classes through urban harvest we teach i teach three straight fruit tree pruning classes of about seven and a half hours and uh, we teach vegetables. We have a 25 hour growing organic vegetables class that runs twice a month for five months. And uh, we do permaculture design certificate course. Uh -huh. And then there are classes on how to start community gardens and school gardens. 
Oh, that's great. Uh, so that's that one. Uh, we also started something called OBA, which is the Organic Horticulture Benefits Alliance, but it originally was started. That's a school garden. We ended up calling them outdoor classrooms. Uh, one of the things, some of you may be in colder climates than Houston, the winter time is normally when it is much warmer, when it is good outdoor weather. And so for kids to learn in anything about the environment or food growing, they really need to do it during the school year, which means that you need to teach curriculum through gardening. And once you start getting better test scores, it turns out that the school system will spend money on urban harvest teachers to, um, to uh, help teachers and students learn this stuff. So what you're looking at there was a bit of a nature pond, although uh, some of that is not, and did, and not native plants, but some of it is also. But they've got fish in that pond and, uh, and they, you see in the very bottom right corner there, there's a bit of a vegetable garden, uh, bottom right, that's it. There's a raised bed in the very corner doesn't have anything in it, but anyway, um, I can see, I can see it. And there, they have fruit trees in that garden and all the rest of it. And um, so there's probably 50 school gardens in, in Metro Houston at this point or more, uh, all of which teaching curriculum, math, science, poetry, you name it, dance even, so. And that's been very successful. Uh, let's see what else there is. Oh Oba, Oba started out as an effort to um, help green businesses be more organic. Uh, nature, uh, garden centers, nonprofits, and uh, especially landscapers and other people that were uh, influencing uh, clients, uh, Texas Medical Center, the Houston Zoo, um, our posh gardens all went organic through some of these efforts. Uh, City Hall, City Hall is organic. The city horticulturalists went through a lot of our programs, including permaculture. So you put a lot of this information together for the home gardener, you wrote a book called Year Round Food Gardening in Houston. Tell us a little bit about your book. Well, uh, four, I've actually written 14 garden books, although 12 of them were basically editions of the same thing, new editions, but they were completely revised. But it started out uh, in 1986 as a handout for a class, and at this point, it's about 511 pages. But what it has been an effort to tell people as much as you possibly can about what they can grow uh, and how to grow it and where to get good supplies. Uh, it's um, been self-published all the time. Uh, somebody else prints it, but basically, and I don't sell it through any national out of state efforts like Barnes and Noble or Amazon. So all the money goes to local groups that are bene that benefit and educate gardeners, which is just exactly what we want. We want people in nursing in nurseries and garden centers and things teaching the right methods. So uh, I, I've been very successful. I probably sold 17,000 copies of one version of this book or another. Um, this one is marketing between 55 and $70, depending on where you buy it and whether you get it by mail. Um, but uh, it's, uh, it covers an awful lot of material and it's, it's specific by different locations. If you live uh, 40 miles 
west of Houston, it'll tell you what your planting schedule is there. Not because the, our temperatures change in different, depending on how far we are from the Gulf and how urban we are. So everything else you do changes based on that. Not to mention what's happening to the climate. Yeah, I uh, used to live in Houston myself. Of course, that's where we met. And as you say, being a distance from the Gulf of Mexico has an enormous, uh, across the Houston metro area, from, from Galveston up to International Airport, uh, especially in the wintertime, you could have a seven, eight, nine, even 10 degree temperature spread, especially at night. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Galveston Island um, out in the Gulf uh, actually had a year where its low temperature for the winter was 42. It was in zone 11. And this last time it was as coldest temperature since 1989. They got 21 the other day, but uh, they hadn't been below 25 uh, since 1996. And uh, uh, Conroe, which is about the same distance north of Houston, uh, had one degree the other day. We had 15. And there's a huge difference between one and 15 and 21 in terms of what you can grow. Um, yeah, so we're talking about a little bit of theory of gardening let's get a little bit more into the application. Uh, when I met you, Bob, it was probably about 1990 or 1991. Of course, at that time, we had a, a permaculture group in Houston. That's how I met Jack. Jack and I, you know, were housemates there uh, up in uh, northern uh, interior Houston, a little bit northwest of downtown, the Heights but we visited different sites around Houston and one of them was, was your property. And this uh, picture here in 1980, that's kind of, uh, I, I think I recognize your house there because when I visited, it was still in the very early going. I think you had planted citrus by that time. There were certainly some banana trees, but you have a pretty substantial subtropical food forest. Tell us a little bit about what you've done on your own suburban property. Well, uh, when we when we bought the house in 1979, it was the first house we'd ever owned. Everything else had always been rentals and uh, different places. Usually for a year or two, we'd have a small garden, this kind of thing. And uh, that tree there in 1980 in the front yard, that tree was probably the first one I ever dug in property we supposedly owned. And the kid in there is four years old and is now something like 45. So give you some sense. And, um, but we bought the biggest piece of land we could afford. And I think we maybe, I don't know, might have had $4,000 down or something like that. <laughs> and plus we, plus we borrowed and second mortgaged and did all this stuff. And uh, we bought the biggest piece of land we could find within a commute, a bicycle distance of where I was working at the University of Houston and uh, was a smallest house that we could make do with. So it needed two bedrooms and one bathroom and stuff like this. So it's a small house by Houston standards and a big, big lot by Houston standards. What's the size of your lot there? 105 by 105 feet. And uh, that far, that urban, it's the biggest lot in the whole subdivision. It's on a corner. And it's actually two lots. It could be subdivided. Uh, so what does that translate? Is that a quarter uh, acre? About How much 0. 0.26, 0. 0.28 acres, something a like quarter, that. A quarter of an acre. Here. 
And it's it, today it's got somewhere between 100 and 140 um, fruit trees on it, a, uh, about 1,000 square feet of raised bed vegetable gardens, a fairly substantial native plant inventory, uh, usual house, driveway, stuff like this. Today we, we grow um, average year in, year out, about 90% of our own produce, um, certainly buy vegetable oil and grains and things like that. And um, we harvest a fairly large amount of water. We have about 4,300 gallons of cisterns. There's another one on the other side of the house. And we um, now have solar panels that some months we don't actually, uh, we're putting more energy back on the net than we're actually getting from them. So um, we're not completely self-sufficient in an urban or suburban lot, but we're not too far away. And the whole thing is designed permaculturally. So what you're looking at there in, the, in 2004 is a swale, um, a, uh, a, there's actually a series of five swales between there and the house. And it is designed in part to, to it's basically a barbed wire fence to keep people from picking all the grapefruits in the front yard. And it's got a lot of beneficial insect attracting plants there. And uh, almost the entire lot is permaculturally designed. So those cisterns you're looking at there in 2002, um, that's the south side. They are a buffer against certain types of hurricane winds. They, in between those two cisterns, there's an enormous amount of heat provided in cold weather. So there's a, a lemon that only survives 25 degrees. It's got lots of green wood without having been protected otherwise um, uh, today after 15 degrees last week. Uh, we had 75 yesterday, so we've <laughs> gotten warm again. But uh, so, uh, Basically, uh, we get vegetables and fruits year round here. Uh, you can do it in much colder climates than this, but this there's there's no reason why we why a person shouldn't get lots of food off the land here. Well, you know, I uh, I saw the the video that was done of your place by a, a visiting person. I don't know what year that video was made. You may know what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah. But but I was pretty amazed seeing that video. This is after I, I hadn't really known uh, what your place had looked like a lot of time it had lapsed since you know I had sort of contact with with what you were doing. And I'm kind of an exotic person myself in terms of, of plants that I like. I've got a lemon tree here in Eugene, Oregon, and banana trees and uh, but your climate, of course, is very different. I'm looking at this right here. That's not a papaya, is it? Uh, I think that's a. No, it's not a papaya. What's it? Is it a fan palm there? Is that the fan palm? It looks like it might be the fan palm. Yeah. Well, that's the fan know, palm. This, uh, this, this tour with this fellow was uh, very impressive because you did have some papayas there. You had, yeah. uh, you were growing bananas. Um, I think you even had certainly not a large, but an effort pushing the limits, even with mango. What kind of exotics did you, did you actually have bare fruit? We had a huge crop of papayas and papayas, if you can keep the temperatures above 30, papayas are really easy to grow because they grow from seed. And if you put them on a, in a raised bed with irrigation in sunshine, they'll fruit in about nine or 10 months from transplant. And if so, if you start the seeds in the fall like and 
plant them in the spring after keeping them warm, uh, there's no reason why you shouldn't get a fairly large substantial number of papayas. And if you go through the winter one year, you'll get an awful lot of papayas. But bananas, there are zone eight bananas like ice cream, which is also called blue java. And uh, they're also quite able to uh, produce substantial amounts provided they get enough water. Uh, we, we've had huge crops of bananas here. Um, and people didn't really, I mean, there is an old Houston one called Burrow that is a plantain that has been grown here since about 1900 or so. But uh, there is zone eight, there are even zone seven bananas, although I don't know what they taste like. Um, that's a corner and there's a huge compost pile within about 10 feet of that corner that nobody ordinarily can see at all from the street. Um, <laughs> uh, and there, what you're looking at there are some native plants that attract monarch butterflies and other kinds of butterflies uh, right out by the curb. Um, and uh, I was on a panel that rewrote some of the ordinances for the city about what um, what you could do in a front yard. So providing there's no HOA or deed restrictions that say you can't do something, um, there's city city rules called the natural natural uh, natural area ordinance is what it's called says you can grow food in your front yard. It says you can grow, you can have a compost pile in your front yard provided that it doesn't do X, Y, or Z. So your neighbors are, are all okay with this. Uh, did you ever have any flack from people walking by? Um, not from people walking by. We've had, uh, there's something called neighborhood protection, which basically the civic association can report you um, and you'll get visited and cited or something if you don't do X, Y, or Z. Um, most of it's fairly reasonable. They don't want you obstructing the sidewalk, for example, or the road. Um, if you don't obstruct the sidewalk or the road, they really don't much care, provided you don't grow poison ivy in your front yard. Uh -huh. um, so I would say on the whole, not not really. We've had a lot of positive comments. We've had, yeah, we get positive comments. Uh, people always say it's very interesting and lots of people, we've given away seeds from a lot of native plants and uh, in butterflies, in monarch season, you see more monarchs around our curb there than anywhere else you've ever been. So there's this, you'll see a little girl and her mother or something standing there with this swarm of butterflies flying all over the place, and stuff like that. Yeah, that's your place was kind of the inspiration for me when I moved up to Eugene, when I finally bought a house, I had in mind your example from something uh, 30 years before, 20 years before. So you don't know how many people you've had influence on who have done something like that on their own properties. So let's shift a little bit here. As I mentioned before, you have an enormous interest in climate change. And I've seen some of the statistics that you've come up with and it's just mind boggling. I can't imagine where you found all that information, all those numbers comparing different parts of Southeast Texas and different temperatures and different times of the year. What's your interest in, in climate change and how has this affected your own garden? How is this affecting where you live? Well, those are all big questions, of course. And um, I was advising gardeners and farmers and landscapers all over Metro Houston, with maybe a hundred mile radius or more, as early as 1991. And um, 
one of the things I noticed is that A, the temperatures weren't the same in different places and B, it was getting harder and harder to grow sweet corn certain months of the year. And basically it was getting too hot in the city to pollinate the stuff in August. And that was the first one. And around that time, uh, Dr. Hansen and Coyota and all that was happening. So began to pay attention to climate change. And by 1999, uh, started teaching the regular 100 hour permaculture design course. And I ended up volunteering to do climate and weather and basically spent a lot of time on this ever since. Uh, and the, so that's part of the interest is just of service trying to help people understand what causes weather and climate and what's happening to it and what can be done about it. And uh, one of the things that everyone who grows vegetables and fruits and to some degree even native plants has been realizing is that quickly the temperatures have been rising and what you can grow is changing both month to month and year to year and you know a fruit tree is supposed to be 20 years and you know will a pear grow here and will it produce anything in 20 years from now uh, and if it will grow here will it also grow um, uh, an hour north of here or an hour south of here and the same thing can be said for you know when do i plant tomatoes and basically this old thing that was common in the northern parts of the country was you basically plant things a certain number of weeks before or after frost or something of that sort. Well, where we are here, our first frost was last week. We haven't had a frost in this yard in three years until now. And uh, then we had a real doozy. And uh, so basically, what I realized was in trying to write the, what amounted originally to a new, a totally new book, was that you had to know what temperatures of various food plants need for how long uh, and what the differences in weather were from one place to another, say 10 year averages or 30 year averages and 30 year extremes and 10 year extremes. Uh, you don't need to know about extremes for vegetables. Um, you know, what, you know, 20 years ago, we had a really bad temperature. Uh, um, doesn't matter with vegetables because they're all die in a few months anyway. But with fruit trees, you really don't wanna be planting an orange if you're going to get temperatures that oranges can't tolerate uh every year so you really need to know that and you also need to know what it will be like in 10 years or 15 years and mangoes basically are supposed to be able to survive down to 25 we haven't had a temperature 25 in about five years until last week uh so mangoes don't really grow here yet but um things are changing did you did you have a, a five year old mango, or did you have any mangoes growing? We we had about a five year old mango. Well, a mango is older than that, but it's been knocked back a couple times. A mango isn't really hardy here yet, and uh, but we had production of star fruit this last fall, which is actually more tender than mangoes. And uh, we were about, we would have had a nice guava, tropical guava harvest uh, this year if it hadn't happened. So we're on the edge of this and Galveston Island, I would say a lot of these things you can grow. Um, and so it really just depends how fast things warm up, but, but this, uh, the Arctic vortex stuff is, is kind of like a random variable and you, you can't really predict this stuff. But this table, basically, I went through 140 annual food plants um, and 
found out what the maximum temperature they grow at. This doesn't necessarily mean they die if it's more than 80, but it means they don't grow. So um, something like um, a beet doesn't really grow, a cauliflower doesn't grow above 80, it's probably 75. And so if your temperature is regularly above 75, you're not going to get cauliflower. It's that simple. Um, and so th that's what that is about. And so what I took was I look at all the ones that I had data on. And this is a table. Um, blow it up like this. It's kind of hard to read. But um, basically, those are temperatures at which they, the maximum temperature there, I believe they will grow at. And uh, you might wonder what vegetable oil plants will produce below 120 or 125. Those are sesame and peanut oil, <laughs> if that's where we're headed. And hmm. uh, then that down below is different uh, parts of the Southeast Texas where uh, different, the number of months in the year where the temperatures are, say, below 65 and will grow cauliflower, um, uh, below 75, below 85, below 95, and so on. And, uh, you know, that's basically telling you something about what you can grow there and what you can't. But um, Hobby Airport, which is the nearest one to where I am, um, you can, there's exactly one month in the year when we have good cauliflower growing weather. And that's and, changed from 20 years ago. Yeah, it certainly has. And um, Brussels sprouts in that same category. And, uh, you know, if you're a farmer's market, it's really valuable to know this stuff because we have farmers from all over Southeast Texas. Some of them are really cold places and some of them really warm places. And you can exploit that. Uh, chili peppers basically love cool nights and hot days, which is what you have north of Houston. And it's a really, but, you know, basil really can't stand on too much heat. And Galveston is cool in the summers, comparatively. Comparatively. <laughs> well, it has, a, it has a, a more or less uh, eight degree swing from coldest to warmest in August. Right. And uh, someplace up north has a 28 degree swing from lowest to highest in August. Yeah, yeah, I lived there in Galveston actually for a couple of years and uh, a substantial amount of time you wouldn't know what time of the day it was uh, by the temperature. <laughs> so, okay, that's, that's real good. I want to make sure we have a little bit of time for this last question that I am certain that you're interested in, we're all interested in say, uh, I think we've touched on this, that you do have a neighborhood association there in your neighborhood and Nancy's a little bit more involved with that. But just say theoretically, Bob, that Nancy came home and said, Bob, our neighborhood association wants you to come to a meeting. And the topic is, given the condition of climate change, the, the recent polar vortex, the, uh, the trends, the economic trends, the changes we're seeing, uh, not only in Southeast Texas, but nationwide and worldwide. What would you suggest people do at home, particularly with their, with their properties, to better prepare to pre-adapt for what we might uh, uh, modestly describe as an uncertain future? How would you describe, explain, encourage people? What could they do at home to prepare for an uncertain future? Well, I thought about this question because you told me we're going to ask it. It's a little bit, little bit hard to figure out a good answer to that question. I thought of about 10 things or so that 
they could do. Uh, I'm not entirely convinced that our particular one would do any of them, but that's a different matter. Well, you know, it's a combination of things. There's not one so single thing, but there's a combination. Basically, of things. basically the low hanging fruit is fruit. Um, it basically the easiest thing for homeowners that are busy and don't understand stuff is to plant fruit trees that have fruit on them that they like that uh, don't require a whole lot of knowledge about maintenance. Uh, things like figs, persimmons, citrus around here. A little bit more work is blackberries, domestic blackberries. Um, there are a ton of more types of fruits that take a little bit more work. But pears are not super difficult if they have a lot of space. And a lot of people don't have a lot of space. But uh, so that that's the easiest thing they can do. And since Urban Harvest has this fruit tree sale every year, and we have a book that has a list of good varieties and where you can get them, um, there is, you know, is not, and also online information about how to plant them and get them through the first year, which is a big problem. So that's one thing. Uh, supporting a community garden or starting one is a second thing they can do. Uh, we have a big community garden in our neighborhood, uh, Bray's Interface, uh, in the power transmission right away and have had one since the 1980s that I helped start. And um, organize a buy uh, a higher amount of local food, especially from farmers markets. Um, um, I would recommend that they have people take our permaculture design certificate course. Uh, basically that's the big picture class on sustainability that covers everything. Whatever it is you're a specialist in, you can use that and plug it into a whole bunch of things you didn't understand that well. Um, and like, you know, and uh, I should say that those of you on the West Coast, uh, Andrew Millison teaches a very good class at Oregon State. Um, he's on my on the point of board with me. Um, and um, help people figure out how to go renewable. Nancy had a, ran a course called Greener Living in Houston, which was designed to do that. The city of Houston has a green building center that uh, people can learn from and probably even get the director of that, who is a permaculture person, to uh, give them a class in what they can do to tighten up their uh, envelope of their house, how they can go solar. There's a solar co-op here that will help you do it cheaply. Um, uh, care of fruits and care of vegetables, those courses could be taught in any community uh, of the local adaptation. Um, start something like Urban Harvest. I see Carol Burton is on here and she's I'm a staff person of Urban Harvest and runs the school garden program. And uh, there she is. And so basically um, uh, Urban Harvest is an effort to help every community uh, association be better at this. So like we support the uh, Westbury, Westbury Community Garden System which is a huge community garden in Southwest of us here. And, uh, and then uh, a manual, every community should have a manual like my book that tells people where they can get quality stuff, what is quality stuff. And this is both by, you know, internet ordering and local and supports local green businesses to do what they should be doing and local nonprofits like Master Gardeners and any number of others to, to doing things like that. So there's a whole lot of things that they can do and it's not as hard to do as one would think, although I, I tell people 
that if it were easy to do, it would have been done already. That's, I tell people that all the time. Activism is not something that uh, is necessarily easy, but all of those things are quite doable. You do not need your government to do them for you or something. Uh, you can do them yourself, which is the basic permaculture ethic of self-reliance and uh, care of people, those two things. You can do it. It's doable. And, and we did a lot of this stuff, uh, not to say that anywhere near the end of things, but uh, and Permaculture Institute of North America is there for people that have uh, particularly that have gone through the permaculture training, because what that does is get us a, uh, um, uh, we are trying to network uh, as many of the 50,000 people that have graduated this course as possible. And anybody who wants to get more permaculture information, if you just Google permaculture in just about any place you could think of, like Oregon or permaculture in Albania or permaculture in dry, dry, dry lands, permaculture, uh, you name it. And you'll see interesting stuff, interesting videos, interesting uh, documents. Yeah, there is a, a steeply increasing interest in, in permaculture, of course. I like to think of permaculture as a language. Of course, a lot of languages all over the world are, are kind of going extinct, but permaculture, in a sense, is a language. And when you meet somebody, when you meet somebody who has had permaculture uh, uh, design course, you already know you have a lot in common with that person. You have a common language with that person. Those are some great ideas. Uh, and of course, many of those ideas are very social ideas about how to prefer, uh, uh, prepare for an uncertain future. And of course, building social capital. I have many times gone on about the value of neighborhood associations and how when a person is involved with their neighborhood association, you can help set the agenda for the association. And that agenda can be local food production and reducing ecological footprints. I would, uh, yeah, and I would add a couple of things there about the, what's called social permaculture is that it's helpful to think of all people that might get involved, all supporters, potential supporters, as having assets to offer. Uh, poorest communities on the planet have plenty of assets, plenty of knowledge, networks, friends, uh, ideas, and so on. Access to locations, um, skills, and uh, so you need to think about when you're designing an organization of all the um, skill sets that you're trying to design. That's the first thing. That you think of people as having things to offer rather than things that are wrong with them. And then secondly, assume that everybody has strengths and weaknesses and that uh, when I plant a tree in my yard, for example, I don't, uh, I don't say to myself that this orange tree has to do everything. It has to give me timber. It has to give me beneficial insects. Um, it needs to be highly attractive. I mean, it might be, but I'm principally trying to get oranges. And when you think about the dozen or so things you'd like to get in a volunteer or a supporter or a staff person. Uh, don't expect them to have everything. If you had somebody who had every good skill at all that you ever could possibly want, except they can't work with people. <laughs> um, give them something to do by themselves or give them a self-help program that gets them to people's skills. But the same thing, uh, can you use somebody who isn't honest? Probably can, if you think about it. Or they're not reliable, or they don't work hard. Uh, 
what I'm saying is we can't afford to throw 98% of the human race out because we don't like something about them. Um, you're not going to get to where we need to get to, which is permaculture. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Permaculture, the, the, uh, the properties, uh, the principles, the ideals, uh, certainly not magic, but uh, I think we'd agree we'd like to see this being taught in schools. There should be a department of permaculture, the city. You know, when I took my permaculture course uh, at Lake Travis about 1990, there was a fellow from the city of Austin and the city of Austin paid his tuition to take the permaculture course. We need to see cities doing stuff like that. Okay, well, Bob, we've been about an hour or so. That's kind of what our, our sort of ideal was. Any, any final thoughts? Well, um, just that, uh, that I think just about every era has major challenges and people are looking at the scary nature of climate change and thinking, how are we going to do this? And uh, I, it is scary and uh, it's probable that we're gonna have a lot more trouble from climate. Uh, but uh, one, there's two things to say about this, or three things, there's plenty can be done. Doing it is important because things will not be as bad as they would be if we don't. <laughs> And uh, the second thing to say though, I, I often tell people, I said, you know, uh, uh, when my mother and father were born, uh, they went through the 1917 flu epidemic. They went through the Great Depression. They went through, uh, I'm gonna, I don't know how this got turned on. Anyway, um, they went through the Great Depression. They went through the Nazis and World War II. Um, and then there was the issue of nuclear war in the 50s. Um, COVID is a bad disease, but I remember the 1970s and 80s when there was uh, HIV AIDS and they didn't even know what, how it was passed, what was causing it in the beginning. And then, uh, and, it, and it was killing people like crazy. And uh, then in the 50s, it was polio and they didn't know how it was caused or why it existed. And uh, not to mention where I was in Africa, where we had, you know, yellow fever and malaria and infectious spinal meningitis. And I had a student with smallpox. So anyway, what I'm trying to say is, is that yes, there are challenges. Yes, we can do something about it, but guarantee you that the price of energy is going to go up in the decades ahead. And the more you can do to reduce your impact on energy costs and the, less, the more self-sufficient you are, the better you're going to be off. That's for sure. Yeah, amen, amen. Okay, well, that's great. Let's just leave it at that.